Uh, hi, Simgal. Welcome to uh, Buy Side Hippies podcast. You know, I'm super, super excited to have you here. Uh, been chasing you for some time, and and thanks a lot for uh, for agreeing to agreeing to do this podcast. Uh, uh, so so again, uh, Simgal, uh, where where are you right now, Simgal? Where are you based right now? So right now I'm in San Francisco. Uh, I'm here for some part of my internship, but it's a remote one, so I'm going to be in different cities. Hopefully, in the next couple of weeks. Ah, okay. Then you're right now based in. in the in, in the west coast for some time for your internship is what yeah. i was doing yeah ah uh, nice 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 uh sundar so again thank you so much for being here and giving us your time uh i really wanted to understand your journey which led you to achieve uh, and become be part of the wartons mba program and you know what experiences you you you've had inside the program and outside the program you know which which is which has made you who you are today so i'm really excited again to you know have you here uh sundar so like like i'll i'll i the, the question which i really wanted to ask you which has been there in my mind for a very long time and i when i when i decided to always do this podcast with you is what prompted you to do your mba uh because because I, as i understand like in your earlier job I, i remember you were the rock star consultant and you had everything which was which was, which was everyone dreamed of being sankal gorseria so what prompted you to go for an mba okay so first up thank you for hosting me uh the flat fee is absolutely not a prerequisite you can just send me a check um <laughs> so yeah like i think uh just in terms of that but uh so yeah like had a good consulting job but the idea was like the way that i thought uh the economy is going to evolve or the way that i thought in general sort of professional careers are going to evolve i thought technology would have an outsized role to play over the next couple of decades right which is where i'd spend the most of my career uh and as such the rationale was like given consulting at lk was a lot of strategy work a lot of due diligence efforts there was limited involvement on the tech side of things even though we might have been doing some tech work there was fairly limited involvement in terms of direct tech so i really wanted to try out a career in tech right because at some point of time uh if not necessarily tech just that exposure is important from an entrepreneurial perspective or from an operational perspective so wanted to get that experience and i thought that an mba would be a good way to pivot into that industry which is why i decided to apply for one ah uh, got it got it got it no uh, this is really helpful just just wanted to understand like you you came from a consulting uh, and engineering background you came from t1 consulting firm and ended ended up at wharton which is which is which is one of the best uh, business schools in the world uh however however uh, say for example uh, i wanted to understand a regular profile a regular indian profile who makes who makes it to what and what kind of profiles do really end up at what and uh, do they also come from similar backgrounds like you from to and consulting firms or or as a new trends uh, trends going on you know a lot of people switch to say uh, private equity vc uh, to actually make their profile or tailor their profile to make it what and ready how, how does it really work out can you please give us some perspective um i think that's that's almost a slight misconception right so sure there's a over indexation of people from this background in the sense that there's a ton of consultants in the class there's a ton of uh, private equity or venture capital investors in the class right uh effectively sort of consulting private equity venture capital might account for let's say 50% of the class uh then there's a whole host of people who come from a variety of different backgrounds right uh so there are people who come from like product management backgrounds there are people who come from finance backgrounds like non sort of investing finance roles there are people who come from startups uh doing all sorts of like operational roles there are people who come from supply chain kind of roles like all of those people and this is specifically talking about india as well right where you don't necessarily have the diversity which we expect in like for example american candidates who could very well come from a sales background as well stuff like that so there is a lot of diversity not just in terms of uh the careers that people choose because it, it's not restricted to just consulting it's also there's significant diversity in terms of the education backgrounds that people come from right once again you'd see an over representation of the iits you'd see an over representation of tu but uh, there isn't that isn't necessarily the case for 100% of the class there's a good sort of an, again I, i don't have solid numbers but off the top of my head i would presume anywhere about 30% of the class that doesn't necessarily Uh, fall within the sort of the iit bracket or like the delhi university sort of srcc stevens bracket as well right so there's a bunch of people from different backgrounds as well i think the one sort of unifying thread that i've seen across people from backgrounds is like there is some element of achievement uh particularly for those people who don't have conventional sort of 
uh, textbook achievement in terms of oh went to a good undergrad landed a good sort of job like these people who don't necessarily enjoy these benefits typically have achieved a lot more in whatever other spheres of life they have right so they could have founded their own companies they could have been like rock stars at whatever their jobs were and that that's like i think that is almost a unifying thread rather than the sort of the consulting of it in, in my mind consulting is almost the most boring route to get to an mba uh it does help because you sort of eliminate one of the largest post mba job categories or you decide that you're going to stick with it right but like essentially it helps from that perspective in that one of the most attractive post mba jobs is something that you've done before it is by no means the only way to get into like wharton or for that matter any other b school got it got it no this was uh, like this was a misconception even i had because you know i've seen a lot of people glorifying you know working in a tier 1 investment bank private equity firm consulting and having and having having the tags of an iit uh, or you know so delhi university and 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 those sort of profiles are 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 over glorified uh, a lot you know he, you need to achieve xyz things to be able to to be able to sort of access these Uh, elite programs, uh, but but as you're saying, over thirty percent of the class Indians, they actually don't come from the uh, the, the traditional uh, consulting, banking, PE background. They actually have other experiences as well, which which adds which adds uh, value to their overall profile, which helps them get into the the elite program. Uh, now, talk, talking about the elite eliteness of the Wharton MBA, can you can you tell me what is it like to attend? an mba program at wharton like you already completed your first year and now you're doing an internship so I, i'm sure you have a very good 360 degree perspective as to how do things really work out on ron what has been your experience like sankal yeah, so i can talk about the mba program in general i don't know about the relative I would, talk, of the I, would request you, i would request you if you can talk about both the academic side of the program and the non academic side of the program sure so yeah i think uh and let, let's let's sort of think about business school in general from that perspective right so on the academic side of things given the diversity of backgrounds that people come from uh it's almost essential that like because the idea is to be business graduates the idea is that you need to have a basic understanding of courses across a variety of domains so for example somebody like me who comes from let's say an engineering background uh i'd have the background necessary in statistics but i don't have the academic sort of background in marketing or for that matter accounting right those are not things that ever done uh versus somebody who's coming from uh, marketing or finance they probably might know sort of corporate finance once again but uh, they might not have a decent background in like financial law uh, or sort of the entire aspect of sort of business ethics etc so all of those things like in terms of there's a whole variety of four courses the idea is to get everyone on a level playing field uh so that if there's something that you haven't had as a result of your undergraduate education or your previous career that basic education is there uh, and that accounts for i'd say anywhere between 25 to 30% of the academic load across your two years uh it's fairly flexible in terms of when exactly do you take it how exactly do you take those courses and the rest of it is really as you want to craft it right because um there's a ton of courses and there's a ton of sort of majors and concentrations depending on what you want to specialize in i think but and i might be wrong but there might be 13 or 14 different majors uh right from sort of finance to marketing to operations um uh, and that that's like you can literally pick and choose whatever courses you want uh you don't even necessarily need to subscribe to one particular major you can like go absolutely a la carte and like just pick up whatever courses you prefer so to that end uh it's there's a lot of flexibility there's a lot of choice in the course curriculum something that's different from the perspective of uh it like going to undergrad in india versus coming here is uh there's some amount of emphasis on cases so i'd say of the courses that i have done in my first year maybe like 15 to 20% of the courses were sort of case led in that most classes would involve reading through and discussing a case in class irrespective of the case element of it there is a lot of focus on sort of class discussion so i i can't recall a single course where the class wasn't interactive uh and it to that end like the professors even in a finance class for example would involve students in sort of explaining how they think or how would they like to approach a problem and to that and it's a very interactive classroom so compared to my engineering days that's something that's particularly different it's also uh like a lot of the subject matter 
starts off fairly simple and then builds up. So to that end, I think most students feel comfortable contributing, right? Versus mm-hmm. in undergrad class, I remember like there'd be five students in the class who would understand what was going on. And then <laughs> there'd be the rest of us who wouldn't have a clue on how diffusion really works. Right? Right. So I think right. that isn't necessarily the case here. Uh, and to that end, the academic experience is significantly better. Uh, that said, just in terms of like the student mind space spent on academics, it's not particularly high, right? Because there's a ton of other things about the program uh, that people sort of index for. Uh, a lot of it is to do with eventual recruiting as well, because like MBAs and what in particular tends to be sort of grade blind in that process, in that there is a great non-disclosure sort of student uh almost student agreement that you don't, you don't put up grades on your CV. So that's not something that really matters to your eventual job prospects. Uh, so to that end, people spend a lot of time sort of participating in professional clubs, uh, sort of networking with other Wharton alumni or even other people in the industry to sort of get to learn a lot more about those jobs. A lot of these jobs entail sort of significant amounts of preparation. So people spend time doing that. Um, that's sort of the professional activities on one side of it. Then there's like a whole host of extracurricular, like social cultural, uh, sporting activities, depending on whatever clubs you want, like anything that you're interested in, there's probably a club for that in Wharton, or if not Wharton, at least the broader Penn community. So that ends up taking a lot of time. Uh, given that a lot of people sort of come after three or four years of like work, a lot of people look at it as a break as well. At least that's how I looked at my first three or four months and well, you just spend a lot of time socializing, partying, just relaxing as well, right? So. All of those like are little nuggets of the experience here and there. Uh, I think the other thing that in particular Wharton or any other sort of B-School also offers is just in terms of access to a lot of quality thought leadership. So that's again something that at Wharton I particularly enjoyed. You'd have uh, different industry veterans uh, sort of coming to the school and talking about their areas of expertise. Uh, there's an authors at Wharton program where you get like industry executives who've written books coming and talking about their work. Uh, we've had sort of heads of sovereign wealth funds coming in and talking about their investing philosophies. Uh, we've had people who've started private equity funds coming in and talking about uh, sort of how exactly do you go about the art uh, to that end. Um, and like we've literally had like people from different walks of life. We've, we've had somebody from Nintendo coming in and talking about, okay, what's the idea of video game design, right? So to that end, like there's a lot of this thought leadership that you can get access to very easily at Wharton. And it's, it's, there's a difference in terms of seeing that YouTube video versus like watching it live. The content that you take away is probably the same, but uh, it kind of feels more real. You almost feel more involved when you're in the room and you feel engaged and you're able to ask questions. I think that's something that I particularly cherish at Wharton. And yeah, like there's just other things which are like almost a byproduct of the time that I'm in business school. But for example, I, I had never been to a Broadway production before right now in and of itself that has nothing to do with Wharton it's just part of the like it's part of being able to access New York and being able to access theater but all of those things also take up little nuggets of your time and that's again something that builds into the MBA experience for me so yeah that's how I think about it what what really stood out for me like two things you mentioned uh, were one uh, there isn't uh, over indexing on your academic grade, which happens, which happens a lot, at least at, at least for a lot of Indian B schools, the top Indian B schools. Uh, as you you you, you spoke about uh, how uh, you don't have to sort of reveal your grades. Uh, I would say in, in your in your resume, etc. That's number one. Uh, number two, access to thought leadership, as, as you'd mentioned, which I believe is something that that a lot of Indian B schools they do lack in providing their their uh, their students with with this experience, which I think eventually forms the kind of decisions you end up making later on in later on in your in, in your second half of your post MBA life as well, which which is actually amazing. That kind of exposure you're getting, Sankar. It's, it's it's second to none. Uh, what I what what I wanted to like really understand was this is something I have heard a lot. Okay, and and I just want to sort of uh, like clarify. A lot of these schools are known for something in particular. They have a particular ethos to it. For example, Harvard and Darden are known for their for University of Virginia schools business school. They're known for their uh, case led MBA, and they and they have a gen general management program is what they're known for. Uh, Stanford program is known for being close to the Silicon Valley and being able to access these tech jobs, etc. School. What is the ethos of the Wharton B school? Hmm. 
So I think a lot of things to unpack there. One is um, just in terms of something that we started with, right? Like Indian B schools, I'm not necessarily sure. Don't do this. It's just it's business leadership in the Indian context, which like for somebody who's intending to pursue a career in India might just be more valuable as well, right? So I won't dismiss that to that extent. Also, not something I'm particularly aware of. Um, and onto like this bit about Wharton and what exactly is the ethos or what does Wharton specialize in, right? So I can give you a variety of different answers, bases different elements. Um, the one sort of most common one is oh, what an index in finance, right? Um, finance. And yeah. to that end, there is there is some truth to that in that uh, if you look at sort of the investment banking industry, uh, there is a slight bit of over indexation from what compared to the other sort of larger B schools, what commands a lot of respect within those circles. And to that end, it's traditionally been a stronghold, right? Uh, that said, one of my professors, like an, a general management professor, uh, sort of she referred to the Wharton specialization as being the analytical approach to business management or sort of like to put it in simpler words, business analytics, right? So okay. to that end, uh, and that's something that we see in a lot of uh, the casework that we do across classes. So you'd see that a lot of the, the decision making is almost sort of very uh, analytics read, very Excel outcome led, like a lot of my marketing classes, for example, Something that I noticed was, okay, a lot of, like, I used to always think of marketing as, oh, it's it's going to be a very artsy thing and we are going to talk about <laughs> it and not necessarily like, yeah. have any, like, numerical or statistical foundation to it. But a lot of the uh, marketing courses that Wharton, at least, look, I've taken three till now, were sort of very analytically driven to that end. So, yeah, maybe that's something that Wharton Index is on as well. Uh, increasingly, Wharton is also an, a, not an area of sort of expertise by any stretch of imagination, but uh, increasingly, Wharton is also sort of extending its roots within the tech ecosystem. Uh, they have a campus, they've had a campus in SF for like six years, eight years, maybe more. I don't know. They're running a semester in SF program. Uh, so to that end, that's also an attempt by the school. Uh, so yeah, like to ask if there is a particular area where Wharton excels in, I think maybe a couple of these answers. The way that I would look at it is, are there areas like which are inaccessible because of the fact that you go to Wharton rather than let's say a Harvard or Stanford or Darden or whatever other schools, right? That I don't think is the case. I have seen people sort of enter into a variety of careers. Like I've seen people like that there's one of my batchmates who's currently interning at a culinary sort of organization as well, right? So to that end, like yes. the school itself lends itself to all sorts of outcomes. There is nothing that you can't really do by virtue of being here. There are academic courses as well as sort of outside classes, sort of professional clubs to support any sort of career choices that you need to make. Uh, so to that end, yeah, like I don't think there's that there is some indexation on a couple of areas, but that indexation is by no means uh, sort of, by no means an indicator of what the broader school experience is like. And I think that's true for Harvard and Stanford as well, right? Sure, Stanford's close to Silicon Valley, but it would almost be churlish to say that Stanford won't give you an excellent private equity investor or consultant for that matter. Got it, got it. No, no, this is this is really helpful just to get and get a perspective uh, because a lot of a lot of things floated on on internet. You know, you have to do X or Y to basically make it to uh, what, and you need to be able to access X amount of jobs, X kind of jobs, uh, which only can happen through, say, a Wharton or a Stanford, but that's not true. Like all kinds of jobs, you end up getting at all kinds of places. But 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 what what stood out for me was when you when you talked about original thought leadership, which you can sort of access. For example, Wharton has certain amount of uh, indexation on finance, uh, which, you, which you mentioned, which eventually helps a lot of students. I'm I'm assuming would help students to network and access opportunities as well in the wall street so you've been here for a year you've seen you interact with a lot of students here you've seen a lot of opportunities there what like one question which always which, which which always think about is what is the what is the correlation between the privilege the background of of a person who's coming to do an, to do an mba and and privilege and the mba what's what's that correlation between people who are pursuing mba and the privilege uh, the privilege they come from uh, I, i'm asking this question because i've seen a hmm. lot of folks uh, especially from a lot of Indian, uh, I would say, uh, conglomerates and uh, business families, you know, who come from very privileged backgrounds, uh, right from the Ambani's to like uh, 
uh, builders. They all they all have they all have accessed Wharton, Stanford, Harvard, MBAs. So I just and, and for middle class, you know, it, like middle middle class person or a, a low middle class uh, low middle class uh, sort of, of come from a low middle class society. You know, a lot of people think about you know it's a very expensive program, and you know that that is something that that that's out of reach, and they sort of lower their aspirations and they go for Indian MBAs. Can you give some perspective on that? Sure. So I think there's almost two levels of privilege here that we need to discuss, right? I think what you're talking about is a very different level of privilege, but the more important level of privilege, I think, which almost everybody in India who's at Wharton comes from, is that privilege of coming from even like an upper middle class family that allows you to go to an English medium private school, right? And I think that's that's something that like that is by any stretch of imagination that's still a privilege in India, maybe what one two percent uh, of Indian families do that. Uh, right. So to that end, like almost everybody who's in the class has enjoyed that privilege. I, I won't sort of know for sure about everybody, but almost everybody who at least I know comes from a good sort of English medium private school in India, right? So there is privilege right there. Uh, being able to access a lot of the Indian education sort of systems that lend itself to outcomes like this, be it the IITs, be it DU, be it second tier engineering colleges, a lot of that also comes from having that privilege of school or having that privilege of sort of post-school coaching uh, that being middle class or upper middle class lends itself to. So yes, is there privilege to that end? I think there is. Uh, in terms of the kind of privilege that you're talking about in terms of like large business houses and them being sort of overrepresented in the class, that's certainly not the case, case at Wharton. Um, okay. like, and I think even to that end, what the way that I would think about it is, and it's it's almost a running gag, right? Like you talk about how there are big business households that are represented, but that privilege also is not that okay. Um, and maybe I don't know about the Ambani example, but it's it's not to the extent where that oh I'm Ambani and uh, like I own Reliance, and so the business school offers you a seat, right? Like that privilege allows access to opportunities in terms of undergraduate education, in terms of careers. And to that end, like the profile of somebody who's coming into the class is going to be as good as the 70 other people who are coming into the class from this, from that country. So yes, does that privilege exist? That privilege does exist. It exists for the other sort of 70, 80 people as well who've had access to a certain standard of undergraduate education, who had access to a, like certain jobs just because of the kind of educational privilege or upbring like family upbringing or almost economic privilege that they've enjoyed, right? Now, it's it's kind of funny to say that, oh, just because we are upper middle class and we have some privilege, uh, it's almost unfair to say somebody who's like, who's the head of a business conglomerate and who has slightly more privilege is being privileged versus the rest of them not being not, right? So to that end, everybody is privileged. Got it, got it. Uh, thanks for this perspective, uh, Sankal. Not, uh, this is not talk, now we're talking about privilege. Now to negate that privilege, uh, basically you, ha you have a lot of scholarships and financial aid, which 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 a lot of students can actually access uh, mm -hmm. uh, when they apply to this uh, to the B school. And I'm aware you had the benefit of enjoying a scholarship as well. Uh, you you you're one of the one of the few brilliant brilliant folks who who uh, Indians who've been able to access this scholarship. Is this is is, is this uh, is the scholarship you end up getting? Is this basically a need-based scholarship or is it or is it a merit-based scholarship and how many Indians usually get access to these scholarships these opportunities to come to Wharton and study mm -hmm. yeah I don't really have access to data uh I can warrant a guess based on the kind of conversations that I've had but like I would presume almost 30 to 40 percent of the Indian class or maybe like even 50 percent of the Indian class would have some scholarship right uh, it could be like it could be a fifty thousand dollars. It could be a hundred thousand dollars. It could be an entire tuition scholarship. Uh, like I, I don't know those exact numbers as to, but I think it's a significantly large number of people who get like at, at least around the thirty thousand, fifty thousand mark. That's a fair number of people, right? Now to that end, uh, my understanding is that Wharton is more merit based than need based because if it were need based, then I presume that you'd be able to answer this question like in a more manner where this number would be around 70, 80 percent, right? I think right. HPS seems to be more need-based. To my understanding, Wharton is more merit-based. How exactly is that merit evaluated is beyond me. So to I to the to this state right. don't necessarily know why I was given like a full sort of tuition fellowship versus like somebody else who was not, because like there is no sort of objective uh 
objective answer provided as to, oh, these are the criteria on the basis of which we determine, right? You don't even apply for fellowship separately. It's, it's just basically you apply to the school and if you get admitted, then they sort of award you the fellowships. Uh, that said, for the vast majority of people, uh, irrespective of the amount of scholarship or fellowship that they have, right? They end up having to take loans, uh, which are fairly easily accessible. So like if you're taking loans in the US, uh, you don't necessarily have to show any collateral, etc. The interest rates are high. Uh, they are climbing even higher given the economic scenario over the last year. So that's a bit challenging. But the idea is that in the event you intend to work in the US post your MBA, the loan itself, it's not, it's not like a big financial sort of issue, right? Because you'd end up coming in, like getting the loan itself is fairly easy. Once you are admitted to one of these schools, nobody's going to refuse you a loan, right? And there are different loan agencies specifically dedicated to providing student loans. So all of that process is fairly standardized. You don't really need much to get the loan. Then paying it off would need anywhere from two to four years of working in the US, depending on what industry you're working in, depending on the kind of salary that you have access to. But to that end, it's not, and like in the event you want to pursue a long-term career in the US, it's not an inhibiting factor. The only reason why like somebody should like think of the economic argument while coming to, let's say, Wharton uh, is if they don't intend to spend any sort of part of their career working in the US, then the ROI given sort of the investment required for the MBA versus the kind of salaries that you get access to in India, then that's something that you might need to consider from an ROI perspective as well. Uh, but even then, financing in and of itself is not a challenge. Like you, th There's multiple options available to that end. Got it, got it, got it. Again, thank you so much, Sankal, for giving this honest perspective in terms of how these scholarships financially work and how should a student applying to to an MBA program should think about think about these uh, tapping into these opportunities. Now, now, now that we're talking about job opportunities, I ha I had this one question uh, around 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 jobs. A lot of people who end up doing an MBA, they want to get say. A, maybe a better paying job or in the same organization where they're working, they'll probably return, they want a higher position. How easy or difficult is it for students who want to change their careers? Say, for example, you're doing consulting in your, in your, in your pre-MBA stint and post MBA you want to access say venture capital or private equity jobs. I wanted, I wanted this specific perspective. If, if you can, if you can have, have, give me two, your two cents, please on this. Okay. So I think there are industries which are fairly background agnostic in the sense that they welcome people from all backgrounds and it's a fairly standardized process. Uh, and I think those, the largest ones there would be consulting and investment banking. Uh, for either of these, you don't necessarily need to have a background. There are scores of people who enter these industries every year without having any consulting or investment banking experience at all, right? Uh, and the, the like, obviously you do need to put some effort in into the end that for if you're recruiting for consulting, you need to do your case preps. If you're recruiting for banking, you need to sort of brush up on your finance uh, sort of knowledge and skills, right? So to that end, you do need to put in that effort uh, over sort of the first couple of months that you're here, over the first sort of five, six months that you're at Wharton. But to that end, those industries are largely accepting of people without have, who don't necessarily have a background in that industry. Then you come to uh, sort of slightly more specialized or I won't, I won't even say specialized, it's just like a different industry. But for example, the investing roles that you mentioned in terms of venture capital or private equity, which do tend to index for prior experience, private equity in particular. Uh, but that said, again, it's not something that's impossible to break into, it's slightly harder, uh, given that these industries do tend to have a strong preference for having prior experience. But again, there are ways that like you can make this work. There are sort of in semester internships that you can do to build that experience. Uh, and there are people who've had those outcomes as well. So who have, have private equity outcomes or invest or sort of venture capital outcomes without necessarily having experience in those sectors. Uh, requires slightly more effort, but again, possible. Uh, I think the only other industry which, which sort of recruits a large, large number of people would be tech. Uh, and there, I think it's, it's almost a mixed bag. So to that end, they do want some experience or some demonstration in terms of, oh, if you're looking for a product role, then they might want you to have worked on something. But again, it's something that's solvable through your time in the MBA itself. So yes, is it trickier for certain industries versus others to switch into? For sure, like investing roles particularly. Uh, is it impossible to get into any industry? Not really. I think the only sort of impossibility exists if you're like, and that's more from 
like a legal perspective than a skill perspective. So there are jobs that you just can't have access to as an international, right? You can't work in the space industry or in the prone industry because there are some ITAR requirements. Uh, you can't like, I think Wharton had this uh, sort of employer session from the secret service or something. And you, you obviously can't work for them. Uh, so yeah, I think those are certain sort of niche areas which are completely sort of off access. Uh, but most other industries are open to accepting uh, students from different backgrounds. Nice, nice. So how, how are you thinking about your post MBA opportunities? Is there something that you're right now, right now inclined towards to pursue post your MBA? Yeah, so the, the way that I sort of came into thinking about my MBA was that I do want to try out a whole host of industries. So I obviously spent a long time in consulting. Uh, I tried out like a stint in product uh, strategy prior to my MBA. Then during the year, I tried out a bit of uh, sort of activity in the early stage venture investing space. I'm now doing an internship in sort of big tech strategy. So yeah, the idea is sort of over the next six months of my semester as well, maybe get like another sort of in-semester internship and then try this entire gamut of industries and then real, like then almost take a pick as to, oh, this is what I like and this is what I want to recruit for. So that's the way that I'm thinking about it, uh, which is not to say that that's the way that everyone should be thinking about it. If you have a sense of where you want to work and that's absolutely perfect. Uh, yes. But if you don't, that's also okay. There is enough and more time for you to sort of explore and figure things out. So yeah, that's that's how I'm looking at it. I think the only thing, the only caveat there is a couple of these industries, for example, consulting and banking sort of tend to recruit early. So yeah, you maybe don't necessarily get an opportunity to experience those as well. Like if you, like, it's going to be hard to enter into consulting or investment banking in case you decide that's something you want to do six months into your second year, right? So that might be slightly tricky, but beyond that, I think it's it's fairly easy to try almost everything out. Awesome. This this gives me a lot of hope uh, for for a jobless content creator like me to be able to like you know maybe think about applying to Wharton at if some LK point. finally decide to fire you, <laughs> my best wish is to whoever took that call. So, uh, so, so, girl, thank you so much for giving this perspective. It was, it was wonderful to like just just put things into perspective and a lot of lot of educated educated uh i would say ed decisions would be made I, i'm assuming post uh post a lot of people who end up seeing this podcast they would do their more research and probably you know before heading into a b school in terms of what they want what they don't want what is possible what is more difficult to achieve even though it's possible maybe not probable etc uh this is the, uh this is i'm just concluding the first segment of understanding everything about what mm -hmm. and your and your, and your aspirations i want to not take you back in my second segment which is basically understanding your pre mba experience uh, as a consultant at lek mm -hmm. uh, i i i i want to understand what experiences experiences in life uh, in your professional and personal life you had which eventually went into making you uh, making you who you are today in your in your pre MBA in your pre MBA stint, right from your work experience, the kind of the kind of projects you ended up doing, which added your the skill set to be to be confident enough to like you know explore the MBA route, uh, etc. If you can give me some guidance on uh, on on this, that'll be really hmm. really helpful. Um, I think I didn't necessarily have a very deliberate view of looking at it. So the way that I started my career in consulting. Uh, was that, oh, I need to look for the job that pays me the highest. And uh, the second thing I was following for was international travel, which is how I started off at Parthenon and then eventually LEK. So it wasn't like a more deliberate choice to that end. Um, and yeah, in terms of like, I, I sort of remember discussing this in my interview for my first job, right? And I was asked, uh, okay, why education consulting? And that's something that I didn't really have an answer for because I and I answered to that and I'm solving for more money and international travel. So that's how I looked at it uh, even back then. Uh, what that meant in terms of the cases that I eventually ended up doing. So obviously LEK does a whole host of work in education, right? So uh, I, I did some 49 cases in my wow. four and a half years. I'm pretty sure all 43, 44, maybe even 45 would have been education or in some way related to education. I think yeah, maybe did like one healthcare case, one tourism case, one case in, in one case in the funeral services industry. Oh, and really? Yeah, a couple of cases in enterprise tech. I think, yeah, so bulk of my work was in education uh, and a lot of that work was at tech. Now, by virtue of the practice, of the kind of practice that LEK is, we end up doing a lot of 
work on commercial due diligence so like these are well, you you sort of know this right like these are short duration high intensity cases uh is that something that i would have actively chosen uh going in probably not right it doesn't necessarily work out the best in terms of work life balance uh is it something that i believe sort of help me and sort of help develop a lot of skill in terms of analyzing business situations sort of um uh, getting getting stuff done i think yes uh and to that end that's something that i almost think is my biggest takeaway right in terms from eli in terms of how exactly to be able to look at a business uh how exactly to go about sort of the primary research the secondary research what are kind of analyses that you need to run or what are the kind of questions that you need to ask in order to take a view on uh, whether a company is investable or not uh and to that end like i think the work was rewarding uh, uh why i necessarily was able to execute that job i don't necessarily have a great answer for that like there's nothing in my sort of undergraduate background or like no formative experiences from my sort of childhood which meant that i would be a good consultant right there's there's nothing of that sort like uh yeah i did my undergraduate in chemical engineering hadn't really used excel a lot before my job started uh so yeah there's nothing sort of structurally relevant there um yeah again like spend some time working with my family which which is a sari business so again very limited use of summits or uh, index match in that in that industry so yeah okay. there's nothing that sort of structurally uh informed the kind of work that i ended up doing or sort of helped me with it uh but yeah somehow i ended up doing that work uh ended up liking it and that definitely helped uh in a lot of ways in the way that i approach sort of problems today right or in in the way that i sort of uh look at things today so now my default sort of mode of something is to enter information into excel see what i can make of that data see what conclusions i can draw and sort of have a list of five questions that i want to ask the next time i'm sort of discussing that problem with someone so yeah like that's that's what you end up getting from doing those cases i'm not sure if i've answered all of the things that you asked but uh, feel free to sort of probe and deeper on any of these bits uh sankar i want to highlight that uh while you were doing consulting you was you multiple roles you started as a as a pre mba undergrad and you were able to because of your performance you were able to access a post mba consultant role at elk so you assume the role of a consultant as well uh, uh who man manages the entire case the entire diligence process to being to being an associate who was more analytical more number crunching slide making uh, uh job so now that you've seen a whole spectrum of 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 from right from doing the work to getting work done uh what what does it really take what is the secret sauce uh, sankal which what makes a consultant uh, great who makes a who makes a great consultant hmm. again i think there are there are different answers to it because like there were there were a bunch of like great consultants i worked with and not everybody had the same sort of working style as i did right so people have have very different uh works and there are there are different ways to making it work uh but to that end like at least the way that i thought it worked was uh, always sort of at a personal level always try and drive towards like what is the right answer uh and then given sort of the nature of the industry or in there's a tendency to spend a lot of time and efforts and and sort of like really look at attack the problem in a thousand ways right um so try and arrive at the most accurate answer uh and by i i say accurate and not precise very deliberately but try and arrive at the most accurate answer with the least amount of effort uh is the way that i looked at it and is the way that i thought about it um and to that end as as somebody who's running a case or executing a case that's what i would say is what makes a good consultant or a, even a good associate for that matter right now a good consultant goes slightly beyond that and that's somewhere where i thought there was like more than enough room for me to improve i wasn't particularly great at that but if that was in terms of man management or people management uh in terms of being able to manage sort of the people who were working with you like the associates or the associate consultants who were working with you in terms of how to 
allocate work, how to sort of get the best out of them, uh, what is the kind of thing that you need to provide oversight on versus something, what is the kind of thing that you don't provide oversight on, um, how how to manage upwards, right? Like what are the kind of requests mm-hmm. to push back on versus what are the kind of requests to accommodate? Uh, I think like that bit of that second bit of it in terms of people management is what really determines uh, sort of a successful consultant versus an unsuccessful one. And really the secret sauce there is just communication. So mm. like identifying what is your communication style uh, and sort of sticking with that and like making that very sort of very clear is something that's very critical. Um, and that was something like for a lot of consultants in our sort of batch at LEK was something we had to build on our own because uh, I for one like only worked with one consultant ever which was on my first case. Uh, and then because of the way the firm's pyramid was, never really got a chance to work with consultants, right? It was working with sort of managers or sort of VPs or partners directly, like even as a three month, four month old associate in the firm. So yeah, that of what a good consultant is, I never really knew because I hadn't, I had seen just the one person and he was amazing, but uh, like didn't really have that archetype to follow in terms of, oh, this is what I need to do in order to be a good consultant. So kind of tried to pick it up on the way. Uh, and yeah, I think the one other thing is, and I hope my managers felt this, but I'd always just try and sort of give my manager or partner or whoever is working with a sense of reliability. So whoever I am working for needs to sort of believe that whatever be the timeline or whatever sort of be the case situation or however tricky like a case might be that this team uh, or this person and this group of people, they'd be able to get to the answer, right? Like if you're able to inspire that confidence uh, in whoever you're working for, that goes a long way in just making life so much easier. So, yeah. Got it, got it. Again, not, he... not a, unlike consulting fashion, not a very well-structured response because I was just like thinking about it as I went along, but yeah. Those are so the, the things that I yeah, said. You're, 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 out of consul- you're out of consulting industry now. It's it's forgiven. You don't have to be started uh, anymore. <laughs> not really. Those, 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 those skills should <laughs> stick around. But yeah, so if I were to then summarize uh, those three things, uh, they would be one, driving towards the answer while minimizing effort, two, the people management bit, and three, just con- like communicating that sense of liability. Got it. One, one, thing, one thing you mentioned... Uh, uh, it, it's it's more of a nuanced uh, nuanced understanding which I've gotten from what what you said is basically taking ownership for your work, and th- I think that is something that that you that that you've highlighted out when you basically make your uh, seniors uh, in the case feel comfortable working with you and get give them that comfort. That's when you're taking that ownership and telling them, hey, I'm gonna get X amount of work done. I'm gonna you gonna you don't have to worry about it. I think that's what gives you that comfort which which a lot of people don't talk about is upward management, you know, how to, how to make your, make your partners and your, and your, and your VPs uh, comfortable, which eventually also, I think, I think helps you, you know, manage the case timelines and crack, uh, crack and get to the answer. Uh, so, so this is something that, that, that's a great perspective. Uh, and thank you so much. And I, I'm sure I can use some of, some of this. I, I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure I'm not, I, I won't be as great concerned, but, but some of it, maybe I can use as well in my job as well. Uh, but uh, Sankar, one last question I had for you. Uh, were there were there any challenges uh, you had in your in your pre MBA in your pre MBA and your and your MBA and your current MBA stint uh, which you faced and 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 something that you've actually overcome which which eventually helped you get a different perspective and that skill set which you will be taking uh, carrying through uh, going forward in your post MBA in, in your post MBA life. Hmm. Um. I think. I think one of the challenges is what I sort of identified in terms of making like a good consultant. So just in terms of getting that communication balance, right, right. That was a big challenge for me uh, because the way that like I started off was, uh, and it was almost a progression, right. I started off with the approach that uh, in the first six or eight months that I was an associate, I'm going to do whatever I'm asked to do. And I'm going to just like execute that to perfection. Right. And almost like in terms of trying to build credibility in that stage. And then sort of once I thought that, okay, I have mastered how a lot of these things work. My approach almost shifted to, okay, I know what to do. I know how to do it. 
please don't tell me how exactly to do this. I'm going to tell you how I'll execute this, how I'll run this case, how, how things will happen. Uh, and yeah, I think that is the kind of approach that can work very well when like you're working with one person, right? So when as an associate, you're working with a manager and you're responsible for one piece of thing, uh, it's almost abrasive to that end when you kind of extrapolate that approach to working with senior members or clients, right? And to that end, just like having that nuanced, almost communication approach in terms of like letting people feel that they've been heard and their views have been incorporated while ensuring that it doesn't add like 20 hours to your week mm. right, is something that like almost that I don't want to call it diplomacy, but almost sort of the subtle influencing bit. Uh, was something that I picked up over time, which I thought was particularly valuable. Uh, and making those right nudges, right? Like in terms of saying that, okay, no, like when, when you get sort of an ask and instead of outright saying no, that's going to take up too much time, uh, almost trying to like get to the same objective that the ask is coming from because nobody sort of wants to make, wants, has an ask, which is solely intended to make you work 20 hours, right? Extra. It's just like, because there is something that they want an answer to and trying to find that way that you can give them that answer or give you give somebody 80% of that answer without investing all that extra time, right? So like almost thinking about it from that more accommodating perspective uh, was something that helped in particular. It was a challenge early on where I was like, oh, but I, if I'm right, then I'm right. Then I don't need to do all of this. Then it's their job to figure it out. I think uh, that was a ch slight challenge early on and something that, I kind of worked on. Uh, the other thing, I think, again, which was a challenge was, again, in terms of what makes a good consultant was just trying to figure out, like, people, right? Like, trying to figure out, okay, uh, like, how exactly will a particular associate respond to this style of working? Because the way that I sort of started working as an associate, given that I never really had a consultant, I used to be given tasks. Like, my manager would be, okay, this is what we need to get done. Oh, we need to build a primary fact base of uh, these 100 schools in Riyadh. Uh, and sure, like that's that's the task that's given, and I'm going to execute it, right? And uh, to that, to my mind, it that allowed for a lot of sort of exploration and a lot of creativity in terms of the way that you would approach something, which is how I would have started working with some associates. Uh, but then you'd realize that there are people who respond differently. There are people who need more specific direction, more specific inputs as well. So almost figuring that people bit out in terms of what resources need, what kind of support. Uh, again, it's it's challenging, right? And like, I'm hoping to sort of do some more courses on this, sort of some of those more experiential activities here at Wharton that help me figure that out better. But that's almost something that, yeah, I struggle with even now in terms of, oh, is there a way to very quickly identify what is the best way to work with someone? Got it, got it. Sankal, thank you so much for uh, for this perspective and for, you know, being with us on this on, on, on this on this podcast. Uh, again, uh, I wish you, I wish you the best uh, with your journey ahead, Sankar. Thank you so much for being with us today evening. You're more than welcome. Also, like it's it's been incredibly fun talking about a lot of these things. I'm not necessarily certain whether the advice I have or the perspective I have is the right perspective. Uh, it's 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 basically stuff that worked for me, uh, but not necessarily true. And like I said, uh, different ways of looking at this. Uh, but also, thank you so much for hosting. I think a lot of these questions uh, also force me to think about, oh, what I was thinking back then when this happened versus what is my perspective now, which is interesting. And I was like, oh, I can't believe I was such an idiot at that point in time. Uh, <laughs> uh, so yeah, to that end, it, it's it's a, almost a helpful process. Cheers. Yeah.